I didn't want to take too long on, on, on introductions, although I do want to tell you they are, they are the, dynam the, the, the true <laughs> dynamic duo in that um, they work together. They've built the uh, Preventative Medicine Research Institute together. Dean is the president and has, um, for those who don't, don't know, is, the, is truly the, the, I don't want to say the brains, behind the, the, a lot of the program and the digital development. She actually has created all the programming that helps this program and the institute share their information throughout the country and throughout the world and is changing, truly changing people's lives. Um, Dean has, for those of you who, who don't know, which I, I can't imagine it's anybody, has been doing this for over 40 years. And uh, we're going to get into a little bit about what, what brought them to write this book and the power of this book. But I wanted to just show a quick little video, if, if, if we could, just to show you, to share with you, so it really spurs us on to pay attention to this, on the power of what this is. Do you want to say yeah, this Yeah, let me up? just, first of all, we're so thrilled to be here. And uh, this is the uh, debut of our book, and we're, uh, it feels very auspicious to be here with, with all of you. Um, you know, we tend to think of advances in medicine as being a new drug, a new laser, something really high tech, and especially in this group, which is all about tech. Um, but I think our unique contribution has been to use these very high-tech, state-of-the-art scientific measures to prove how powerful these very simple and low-tech and low-cost interventions can be, which we've reduced down to eat well, move more, stress less, and love more. Boom, that's it. And the more diseases we study and the more mechanisms we look at, the more evidence we have to show why these simple changes are so powerful and how quickly they can occur. And so this is an example of a, a man who's a, a physician himself, an internist named Robert Troyhartz, who we mentioned in the book here. And he, was, uh, he had such a bad, bad heart disease that he was told that the only thing that could save him was a heart transplant. His heart was pumping so poorly. And so he went through the program. We've been training hospitals and clinics around the country. Uh, Medicare and other insurance companies are, are paying for it. We've been partnering with a company called ShareCare to get it out there. And what we're finding is, is that in his case, um, that he went through our program at UCLA, one of the sites we've trained, to be in better shape for the heart transplant. And after nine weeks, he improved so much he no longer needed it. So if you can roll the clip, I think it's a good example. So the situation I'm describing here is of an internal medicine doctor who started a new chapter in his life with his wife, moving to Lake Arrowhead, having just opened uh, a private practice office after all of our kids went to college and we could relocate. And just as this was ramping up, we had a horrible car accident which precipitated a heart attack that dropped my cardiac functioning down to basically uh, 11 uh, to 13 or 14, 15 percent of what it should have been, which resulted in intractable chest pain, angina, trouble breathing, inability to walk from room to room, go upstairs without being carried, was offered a heart transplant as the only way to stay alive. And at the 11th hour, I entered the Ornish program, which provided me with the, an entire paradigm shift with respect to stress management, exercise, diet, nutrition. And despite not believing it myself and having other physicians who didn't believe in it either, it uh, worked beyond my wildest dreams. I'm now able to exercise moderately. I can work full time, I can live at 6,000 feet, and uh, our quality of life is actually better than it was before. I'll even let him take my lipstick off. Can you believe this is my wife? <laughs> so, you can see the power of, of what you are talking about both in the book and what you've been talking about for 40 years. D Dean really has pioneered uh, a, new, a, a new type of medicine called lifestyle medicine. It was really you who created this back, about, what, 40 years ago? Yes. Um, shunning a lot of the conventional thought that, uh, that uh, what we do, how we think, how we live, really does affect our, our life. Can you tell us just a little bit about how you, how you came up with that and what really drew you and brought you to lifestyle medicine? Yeah, I appreciate the question. Well, lifestyle medicine is, to me, the most exciting field in medicine today. And it's using lifestyle changes not only to help prevent disease, which we all know, but to treat and often even reverse it. 
and we showed, and I, I was a second year medical student when I started doing this work in 1977 in Texas, uh, and I was learning how to do bypass surgery with Michael DeBakey, the heart surgeon, who pioneered bypass surgery. And uh, although in Texas they say, you know how we tell pioneers? It's by the arrows in their backs, but that's another story. <laughs> anyway, and so we would cut people open, we'd bypass their clogged arteries, he'd tell them they were cured, and they usually go home, and more often than not, they do all the same things that had caused the problem in the first place. You know, eat junk food, smoke, not manage stress, not exercise. And often these bypasses would clog up, so we'd have to cut them open in two or three times. And I said, there's got to be a better way. And so bypass surgery for me became a metaphor of an incomplete approach. So we were literally or figuratively bypassing the problem. And similarly, when people get put on medications to lower their cholesterol or their blood pressure or their blood sugar, and they say, doctor, how long do I have to take these? What does the doctor usually say? Forever, right? It's like, so when I'm, I've been showing a slide for literally decades of doctors busily mopping up the floor around a sink that's overflowing, but nobody's turning off the faucet. It's like, how long do I have to mop up the floor? Like forever. Well, why don't we just treat the cause? And what I'm continually impressed by, and Anne as well, is that how powerful the healing can be and how quickly people can get better. And so in the new book, what I, I'm presenting this new unifying theory that says basically, although we were trained to, you know, like you and I were both trained to view heart disease and diabetes and prostate cancer and Alzheimer's disease as being fundamentally different diseases, that in fact, they're really just the same disease manifesting in different forms. That's our unifying theory because they all share the same underlying biological mechanisms like oxidative stress and chronic inflammation and changes in the microbiome and telomeres and gene expression and so on. And each one of these mechanisms in turn is a direct function of what we eat, how we respond to stress, how much exercise we get, and how much love and support we have. How quickly you can get better, and for that matter, how quickly you can get worse just by making these changes. Yeah, the amazing thing is if you think about it, it's something that we all, now, and we want to say it's an, it was an, it's an intuitive thought that what we do affects us, uh, our health, right? Just use smoking as an example, right? Everybody knows, well, you smoke, you're going to get unhealthy. You stop smoking, you're going to get better. I, I, I'm still in awe of the fact that as a second year medical student, you really were the pioneer of that <laughs> thought of we can really, if we can make it worse, we can make it better. Yeah, well, one of the nice things about being a medical student is you don't know enough to know it's possible. You know, exactly. kind of like going to the moon, you know, and, and it is hard. You know, I love that line from John F. Kennedy. You know, we're not doing it because it's easy. We're doing it because it's hard. And this is hard, but, you know, changing lifestyle can be hard. But the benefits, what you gain is so much more than what you give up. That's what really makes it sustainable. Yeah. So in, in the new book, um, you really have, a, a, the beauty of it is it simplifies everything down. It doesn't make it difficult to do. Um, the, together, you really did sort of make this beautiful blend of four pillars. Can you, can you get, both explain uh, yeah. that a little bit? Um, so, there's a, the, the book begins with a quote from Albert Einstein, one of my favorite quotes, that says, if you can't make it simple, you don't understand it well enough. And so uh, Anne and I have been working together for 20 years. She developed a whole learning management system for the hospitals and clinics that we train across the country. She's brilliant in really making it simple in that way. And my, the other reason is that my favorite key on the computer has always been the undo button. And I thought, wouldn't it be nice if we had an undo button in our lives? And now we do. And so it turns out that a lot of these chronic diseases that we were told that people have to suffer from can actually be reversed by making these changes. Do you want to talk about the four pillars a bit? So everyone can certainly sign up for eating well. We all know that. Moving more, we learn that. Stress, something that we all know is epidemic and we all need to do more while we're trying to stress less, which is easier said than done. And yet we have proven techniques that, although it would be ideal to practice over, say, one hour a day, don't have to happen uh, all at once. The, the duration is less important than the constancy. So even a few minutes several times throughout the day for mindfulness, self-reflection go a long way in allowing us to choose how we respond to stress. Although we can't necessarily change the stress in our life, we can definitely choose to respond to it in healthier, more productive ways. And last but not least, love more. This is something that we don't hear very much when it comes to medicine. Yeah, love is kind of a four-letter word in cardiology circles, even though the heart <laughs> is the symbol of it. <laughs> and when we all know that we all have a, a mobile device on us, and the average American is spending five hours a day on screens. And yet 40% of, uh, of us 
uh, report feeling lonely and isolated despite all of this social time. And so when we practice loving more, and what we mean by that is being able to express your authentic feelings and holding a space to empathically allow others to express their feelings. It's really simple and really powerful. So to the extent that we can redistribute some of that time that we may otherwise be spending on our screens that statistically show that are actually further isolating us, if we can spend some of that time to intentionally choose to schedule time for our loved ones to live the life that we love with those we love, there's a corresponding benefit. Yeah, and to build on that, just, you know, we all need to eat. It's just a question of what, and most people are exercising, you're really out there doing something. But love and support, it sounds so touchy-feely, and I used to get defensive. People say, oh, this is so touchy-feely. You live in California. It's an altered <laughs> state. You know, they'll do anything there. And I, I say, no, no, look at our quantitative arteriograms and our PET scans and our radionuclide ventriculograms and blah, blah, blah. One, I said, you know, it is touchy-feely. That's what makes it work so well. You know, we are touchy-feely creatures. We're creatures of community. And study after study have shown that People who feel lonely and depressed, which is uh, what Anne talked about, even the opioid epidemic that you'll be hearing about later is just a, one way people cope with that pain. You know, I ask people like, why do you smoke or overeat or drink too much or work too hard? These behaviors seem so maladaptive. They'd say they're not maladaptive, they're very adaptive. They help us deal with our loneliness, our pain. And study after study have shown that people who are lonely and depressed are three to 10 times more likely to get sick and die prematurely from virtually all causes when compared to those who have a sense of love and connection in the community. I don't know anything in medicine that has that kind of impact. So giving people information is important, but it's not usually sufficient. I mean, we're drowning in information in the era of, of Google. And, and focusing on behaviors isn't enough. We need to deal with the deeper issues. And so when we put people in support groups, we try to recreate what they had 50 years ago when we had an extended family or two or three generations of people living together or a church or synagogue or, an ex or a, a job that felt secure. And people can let down their defenses and not talk about how to stay on the diet, but what's going on in your life? Tell me what's happening. Let me share with you my feelings. You know, one study showed that the more time you spend on Facebook, the more depressed you are, because it's not an authentic intimacy. It looks like everybody has this perfect life but you, because people don't talk about, you know, I may look like the perfect dad, but my kid's on heroin, as some one pe person might say, or, you know, this is what's really going on in my life. And when you grow up in a neighborhood with two or three generations of people, they really know you. They don't just know your Facebook profile or your bio sketch. It's like, you know, I see you, you know, it's not just your, you know, your, your best self, but I see all of you and I'm still there for you. And there's just something really primal about the need to connect with each other on that level. Yeah, and I think as you mentioned, study after study shows that if we don't have healthy, supportive, intimate relationships, yes. that every aspect of our health really does suffer. Yeah. And I think that they're also finding that addiction and, and stress, but along with health, really really does go on a decline. You're much more likely to die from a chronic disease That's earlier exactly right. if you don't have that kind of a relationship. And more importantly, it's, it makes it more fun, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it really, we can't emphasize that enough because if it's not fun, who wants to do it, right? It's certainly not gonna be sustainable. So if we, as far as moving more, do whatever activity, horizontal, vertical, <laughs> whatever you love, do it, make it fun, and then you'll do more of it. And so in general, the whole lifestyle, it might seem like, you know, it, it can be hard, you know, at the same time, you know, life is to be enjoyed. And so people might come into trying to reverse into our program, trying to reverse a disease. There's a lot of fear in that. Um, and that can initially open the door, but what keeps you walking through the door day after day with every choice that we make is identifying for each of us, it's a very personal question, what is your personal motivation for wanting to live longer and better? Only you can answer that. We can stand up here as the people have done research on, on this. Your, your loved ones can say, we know this is what's best for you, you should do this. But until you identify it, for yourself personally, why I want to live longer. What are, what are your, the peak moments that you've had in your life so far? Do you want to have more of those? What are, what are the dreams that you have and with whom do you want to share those dreams? If you can identify that and then when you have that moment of temptation, because we all do, it's right around the corner, if we can just take a moment to reflect, take a deep nourishing breath and reconnect with that motivation inside ourselves 
and then reinforce. It becomes self-reinforcing from the inside out. And that's what makes this not a change that someone else is prescribing to us, but a choice that we're reinforcing and self-reinforcing with our own direct experience of the benefits. Yeah, and to build on that, it's me if it's meaningful, it's sustainable. Uh, and if it's pleasurable, it's, sustain it's sustainable. And meaningful, you know, Viktor Frankl 50 years ago wrote that book, Man's Search for Meaning, about concentration camp survivors. And it wasn't the healthiest or the strongest, it was the ones who said, I have to survive so that I can, whatever, bear witness, be reunited with my loved ones. And from a pleasurable standpoint, as Anne indicates, these underlying biological mechanisms are so dynamic that when you make these changes, to the degree you make them, and it's not all or nothing, most people feel so much better so quickly it reframes the reason for making them from fear of dying to joy of living, which is really what makes it sustainable. And I, I, in the first chapter of the book, I talk about this film that Louis Saihoyos did with uh, James Cameron, the legendary uh, filmmaker, and, and uh, Louis got a, an Academy Award for doing The Cove, the uh, dolphin slaughter in Japan called Game Changers, which was gonna come out. And there's this wonderful scene where, and, and, and uh, James Cameron became a vegan about eight years ago because more global warming is caused by livestock consumption than all forms of transportation combined. And it takes 14 times more resources to make a pound of meat-based protein than plant-based protein. There's enough food to feed everybody. No one need go hungry, which I know is one of the great goals of startup health here. And so they filmed these three elite athletes um, who they gave them a single meat-based meal, organic, grass-fed beef, et cetera. And then they did this device where, with a urologist where they, they measured how frequently and how hard their erections were that night after they ate that meal. And then they repeated it the next night with a plant-based meal, one meal, and they found they had 300 to 500 percent more frequent erections and uh, 10 to 15 percent harder erections after one plant-based meal than one meat-based meal, just to show how dynamic these mechanisms are. Apparently the film crew uh, became vegan after after, uh, after filming. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm having a salad for lunch. <laughs> That's exactly what they said. They said, on your, when you go on, you're taking your date on Valentine's Day, where are you going to go? And they said, well, we're going to go to the veggie grill or someplace. Yeah. <laughs> but but, but it, the, the whole film is based on, you know, these elite athletes who raise their game when they began eating this way. Your brain gets more blood. Your face gets more blood. Now, we're doing a study now to see if we can reverse uh, Alzheimer's disease by making these changes. So the more diseases we study and the more mechanisms we look at, the more reasons we have to explain why these changes are so powerful. And to take it out of the context of, oh, am I gonna to live to be 86 instead of 85? Or, you know, if you know, the only way you get to live to be 100 is by not doing all those things that wanna make you live to 100, or am I gonna live longer, is it just gonna seem longer? All those kinds of cliches to say, these are changes that make you live better, as Anne was saying. You feel better, you look better, you have more energy, you have better sexual function. You know, you're, if you have heart disease, your chest pain goes away. And for someone who can't, you know, walk across the street without getting chest pain, or like this guy in the video is about to have a heart transplant and can't make love with their spouse, or you know, can't play with their kids, or can't go back to work. And usually within a few days to a few weeks, they can do all of those things. They say things like, yeah, I like eating junk food, but not that much, because again, what I gain is so much more than what I give up, and how quickly I can experience that. Yeah, and I just want to point out, this is all scientifically proven. This, yes. is, this is really the only diet that has this kind of scientifically proven reproducible results. We have done the only randomized trials that have been shown to actually reverse heart disease by changing diet and life. And it's not just the diet, it's all part of this. And Medicare spent 16 years reviewing our science and, and they created a new benefit category to cover our program. So we've been training hospitals and clinics and physician groups and health systems around the country to create this new paradigm of healthcare rather than sick care. And it's working. We're getting bigger changes in lifestyle, better clinical outcomes, better adherence, and bigger cost savings than anyone's ever shown. And the irony is that doctors say, oh, I can get my patients to take their, their Lipitor, their drugs, but there's no way they're gonna change their diet and lifestyle, and yet, the, the pharma company's own data show that half to two thirds of people prescribe Lipitor and other statin drugs to lower their cholesterol are not taking them after just four months. And a third of prescriptions never even get filled. And yet our program, people come, instead of a 10 minute visit, they come twice a week for four hours at a time for nine weeks for a total of 72 hours. And it's a doctor, a nurse, a meditation teacher, who would have thought Medicare would be paying for a meditation and yoga, uh, an exercise physiologist and a psychologist and a dietitian all working together. And 85 to 90% of people complete their 72 hours, and a year later, 85% of them are still following it. So we're getting, actually getting better 
people are more likely to change their lifestyle in these major ways than to take a pill. And Bill Sartre goes, that's crazy, how could that be? And the reason is that the pill doesn't make you feel better, but the lifestyle changes do. And there's no point in giving up something that you enjoy unless you get something back that's better and quickly. And again, because these underlying mechanisms are so dynamic, you feel so much better and it comes out of your own experience, you say, okay, these are choices worth making. And yeah, I'll probably live longer, but you know, I was suicidally depressed when I was in college. That's how I got involved in all this stuff. And if you tell someone who's lonely and depressed they're going to live longer, that's not really motivating. They're just trying to yeah. get through the day, you know. And so it's the short-term benefits that really make this sustainable. If it's pleasurable, it's sustainable. If it's meaningful, it's sustainable. And we're, we're grateful that the panel of experts at U.S. News and World Report just ranked it's the number one heart-healthy diet for the ninth year in a row. And at the same time, what's, what's so amazing to us is that we never set out, Dean never set out for this to be a, a diet. It's not even a diet. It really is a way of eating, but moreover, a way of living. It's this, the comprehensive lifestyle. So to, to not isolate it down to just what we're eating because there's a, a synergy, something so much larger that happens between all of these lifestyle pillars working synergistically together. They all are self-reinforcing and ripple out to our community. And I was going to say, the interesting thing is when you say diet, there's something almost negative yeah, like, about it, oh, right? Yeah. Constricting. <laughs> is that one of the obstacles yeah. in getting people to embrace this oh, kind yeah. of a lifestyle? You know, people think like, you know, again, am I going to live longer? Is it going to seem longer? Diet is all about what you can't have and what you must do. And part of what we've learned is that even more than being healthy, people want to feel free and in control. And as soon as I tell somebody, you know, eat this and don't eat that, they immediately want to do the opposite. And you know, sometimes when I lecture, I joke, that goes back to the first uh, dietary intervention, you know, when God said, don't eat the apple, and that didn't go so well, and that was God talking. We're not going to be better than that, and apples are good for you. So I've learned to say, look, in the book, it takes this, it's the same idea. This is what we did. It works. And if you want to do it, here's how. If you don't, that's fine, too. And to the degree you do it, there's a corresponding benefit. To prevent disease is the ounce of prevention. The more you change, the more you improve. If you indulge yourself one day, eat healthier the next. If you don't have time to exercise one day, do a little more the next. You don't have time, as Anne said, to meditate for an hour, do it for a minute. Whatever you do, there's a corresponding benefit. But if you're actually trying to reverse disease, the pound of cure, and as you say, we've published our findings in all the major peer-reviewed journals, the Lancet, the New England Journal of Medicine, JAMA, Circulation, etc. It takes a lot to reverse disease. That's why we're the first to prove you could reverse heart disease, then di type 2 diabetes. We did a study with Peter Carroll and, and Bill Fair showing we could slow, stop, and reverse the progression of men with early stage prostate cancer, by extension, early breast cancer in many cases. We did a study with Elizabeth Blackburn, who got the Nobel Prize for discovering telomeres, showing that we could lengthen telomeres for the first time, reversing aging at a cellular level when the Lancet published article is what they called it. We did a study with Craig Venter, who was the first to decode the human genome, showing that in just three months, over 500 genes were changed, turning on the good genes that keep us healthy, turning off the bad genes that cause us to get sick. So again, the more diseases we study, and we're now doing the first randomized trial to see if we can reverse Alzheimer's disease. And, you know, there are no good drugs for treating it or preventing it. So if we can show we can reverse Alzheimer's, and it runs in my family, my mom died of it, so, and she was a genius. It was really so sad to see her, you know, this great mind begin to decay. And I think now we're at a state with respect to Alzheimer's very much where we were with heart disease 40 years ago, that there's every reason to think it's going to work. We're already beginning to see improvements in some of these patients, and it's exciting to be part of it. And that's part of the value of research is it raises awareness, and awareness is always the first step in healing. And that's what you're doing with this amazing conference is raising awareness. And so that's why we're so grateful to be part of it. Well, we're so grateful that you're here because you, you, the two of you are really the original health transformers. And if you think about what your personal moonshot is together, it really does transcend almost every moonshot that we have because um, not only is diet, health and well-being, access to care, curing chronic disease, yes. mental health, wellness. Um, the interesting thing about this Four simple steps. Uh, it's not really just a health book. It's not about health, but it's really a happiness book, right? It's a happiness and transformational book. It's helping people use the experience of suffering as a doorway for transforming their life. Because, you know, change is hard. But if you're hurting enough, suddenly it's the idea, well, that's kind of weird stuff, but the science shows it works. Let me give this a try. And then once you try, you start to feel so much better. And it comes out of your own experience. You go, oh, okay. 
I connect the dots between what I do and how I feel. When I do this, I feel good. When I do that, I don't feel so good. So let me do more of this and less of that. And from a health policy standpoint, as you indicated, 86% of the $3.4 trillion we spent last year on health care, which is mostly sick care, are for treating chronic diseases that can be largely prevented or even reversed by simply changing lifestyle. That frees up tremendous resources to make true health care available to everyone who needs it. Yeah, and one of the things that just uh, I want to end with is uh, y you were very good friends with Steve Jobs. Mm -hmm. I know you did a lot of work with him, and uh, a lot of times he would say to you, "If you don't, if if it's not simple, if you can't make it simple, you don't understand it enough." That's true. Yeah, Steve was one of my closest friends. Uh, I never talked about it when when he was alive. Uh, but I learned from him, again, that if you, can really, if you really understand something, you can make it simple. The iPhone's a perfect example of that. We used to have a lot of discussions about that. Uh, you don't need a user manual. You know, it's just my two-year-old, when she first saw one, uh, when she's nine now, uh, you know, could understand how it works. And so that's the way that we wanted to make this book, and uh, to really reduce it down to its essence. You can do it. It's fun. You're going to feel good. And by the way, you're going to help prevent a lot of bad things down the road. But it's a, it's a love-based program, not a fear-based program. Well, I cannot thank you guys uh, enough for being here, oh, sharing you. with this and doing the world premiere of, <laughs> of the book personally with us here at the Startup Health Festival. Truly, I encourage everybody to, to get a copy of this book, read through it. I was reading it last night, and I have to tell you, it's hard to put down, and it's inspirational. I even shared with you this morning, we were running, I was running late, and I said, I have to, I have to do my exercise today. Put me in a better mind, uh, to, uh, you know, in a better place, made me feel better, gave me a little bit more energy. So it really is about a choice. Um, and hopefully we'll all choose to, uh, to listen to Ann and Dean and uh, get healthy and get happy. So thank you, thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you.